We are very glad to have you here. We have been working on this event, Juan Panay, since April. And we are very happy to see it's unfo it unfolding today. Uh, the exhibition will be in display until Saturday, in case you miss it. And now we start our open forum, which will, each participant will have 10 minutes to present their topic uh, in relation to our topic of displacement, focusing on the San Francisco Bay Area. So I just wanted to um, provide a very brief introduction, um, perhaps a little bit broader than the Bay Area, uh, in terms of my comments. Um, and I wanted to think a little bit about the power of art and writing in relation to the conference theme of displacement. So my own research is largely based in the Caribbean, contemporary Caribbean. And the Caribbean has the grim, grim distinction of being the only region in the world where indigenous people were almost completely eliminated. Any discussion of the modern era needs to begin with this moment because many people are still unaware of the fact that this, that this was the worst genocide in human history. It occurred during the New World Conquest. An estimated 35 million people were killed. The Americas were 90% depopulated in the first 100 years of European colonialism. This is still a very traumatic fact um, uh, for many of us. But I, as a teacher here at the Art Institute, I often try to talk about subjects that are difficult, and many students are not aware of, I think, of this history still, so it's important to bring it up. Um, <clears throat> in the same moment, one of the greatest examples of the political power of writing was a book that was published by a Dominican priest in, the 15, in 1552 called The Devastation of the Indies which includes extremely disturbing and graphic descriptions of the brutal treatment of native people by the Spaniards. This book circulated among the literate classes in Spain, and this eyewitness account was so shocking and powerful that it prompted the Spanish crown to end slavery of native people in this early period. Of course, an assimilationist strategy of Christianization and colonization ensued, but many of the issues raised by Bartolome de las Casas resonate with struggles even today, and this book, in many ways, was kind of one of the first uses of the press to powerfully advocate for an end to war and atrocity. In a very different kind of example, I want to highlight um, the tradition of American photography, especially of the Western United States in the period of settler colonialism in the late 19th century. Early photographs of iconic scenery from photographer Carlton Watkins and others were intended to be picturesque but also to produce scientific knowledge about Western territory. Even today, many art students simply learn about these photographs in relation to apolitical ideas about composition, or the quote-unquote sublime. And these, photo these landscapes functioned as a form of knowledge and ideology that erased the native presence and produced imagery of Western territories as empty and available for settlement, which can be thought of as a form of visual and epistemic violence. I think when one really starts to understand the history, these photographs never quite look the same. And I think that's a really important lesson, especially for an art school, because um, uh, too often it's just sort of viewed you know, as, a, as a sort of beautiful composition. Finally, I want to bring some of these issues into the present. In the United States, we often think of issues like censorship or political prisoners as problems that exist in less democratic countries elsewhere. But especially since the period of activism in the 1960s and 70s, the US government is actively engaged in violent suppression of Native American activists. Leonard Peltier has been imprisoned for 40 years on a double life sentence for allegedly murdering two FBI agents in 1975 during a conflict on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. A wide range of individuals and organizations, including Amnesty International, have compiled overwhelming evidence that Peltier was framed for the murders. Peltier is also an artist and his art is currently part of an exhibit celebrating Native, National Native American Month in Washington State as, as we speak right now. But a couple of days ago, his art was targeted and will be dismantled because the FBI, joined by state law enforcement, opposed Peltier's art being shown. Peltier's defense committee members have claimed, quote, this is overt government censorship and it's unconstitutional. Leonard Peltier 
has been wrongly imprisoned for 40 years, and he's also not in good health. There's currently a really strong movement to um, an organizing effort going on to have President Obama pardon Leonard Peltier. So I would urge you to, uh, at your earliest convenience, go to this website, free Leonard, free, sorry, freepeltiernow.org. There's a lot more information about his case, and there also is a, are a lot of uh, suggestions for letter writing and, and uh, this campaign to have him pardoned. And uh, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Michelle Krasowski and I'm a librarian and archivist at the Internet Archive. And you may be familiar with the Internet Archive already by name or by its web address archive.org or by some of its more popular services like the Wayback Machine which has been archiving web pages since 1996 that lets you explore the history of the web. We also have Open Library which is an online library that has over one million public domain books available as well as a modern book lending library. And whether or not you're already familiar with the Internet Archive, here's a little bit more information about us. We are a 501c3 nonprofit that was founded to build an internet library, and our purposes include offering permanent access for researchers, historians, scholars, people with disabilities, and the general public to historical collections that exist in digital format. The vision that lies at the heart of the Internet Archive is that of our founder, Brewster Kale, who was inspired to create a digital version of the Library of Alexandria to collect all the world's knowledge for the purpose of providing universal access to all knowledge. And we were founded in 1996. We've been located in San Francisco since then, first in the Presidio and now in the Richmond neighborhood. In late 1999, the organization started to grow to include more well-rounded well collections, and now the Internet Archive includes texts, audio, moving images and software, as well as archived web pages in our collections, and provides specialized services for adaptive reading and information access for the blind and other persons with disabilities. By making this online platform available for anyone who is interested to build a collection for free, it provides a place where people can share recordings, resources, and viewpoints that support the topics that are important in their lives, including the monumental community activism and fights for social justice that the Bay Area is historically known for. Earlier this year, the Internet Archive received a Knight Foundation grant for our Building Libraries Together project to develop the new version of our website. This is a two-year project to build a tool set and user interface that allows communities outside the archive to save, manage, and share their cultural treasures, further democratizing access to all knowledge. Citizen archivists will be able to build collections, enhance metadata, and join like-minded communities in deciding what of our history gets archived and made accessible to everyone forever for free. With the definitions of higher education and research institutions expanding in the online realm, a more inclusive view of libraries and archives can follow to open the way for more diverse collections. The limitations of physical space and access are being overcome by the ability to create an online collection. A virtual environment now provides the opportunity for people of all cultures to share their stories in such a way that allows them to reclaim and rewrite their histories as their own, not reinterpreted through another culture's perspectives or academic paradigms. Our online storage is free and open to people of all backgrounds with an interest in creating a collection. Uh, experts in their fields of interest or study who have their own privately curated collections. Enthusiasts and hobbyists who have a passion for a particular subject area. And creators of the original content housed in their own collections. They all have the equivalent of shelf space to share their information on the Internet Archive and to make it available to the larger community who can benefit from their work in these collections. When we include more diversity in our collections, more perspectives will be encountered by the communities that use our resources. As our government searches for a new appointee to the position of Librarian of Congress, a focus on increasing diversity of content in the Library of Congress collection is one major initiative being requested by members of the library profession, and I am hoping that the Internet Archive can set an example for the benefits of providing this. And while we're making it easier for people to upload content to our site and start their own collections, this service has been available for a while now, and we have some great collections that people have contributed to. 
If you wanted to add an item to the archive today, you would be able to. Any user can log in and add files to our community media, audio, text, or software collections. If someone reaches 50 uploads or has a collection of 50 more items to upload from the start, our collections team will make them their own collection. And also there are many collections that have been started by people and organizations that interested users are encouraged to add content to after they get instructions and permission from the people who oversee those collections. The scope of collections housed on the Internet Archive has benefited greatly from individuals who understand the possibilities provided by access to free storage and the ability to use the site as a platform to share resources with the community and who have devised solutions to make digitization possible for people with limitations. At this point, I'll take the opportunity to talk about some of the unique and valuable collections that partner with the archive that offer the chance for a wider variety of perspectives to be accessible to researchers and as our cultural legacy. So I'll start with the Alone Profiles Project. This collection is particularly important for political and activist reasons to make the case to the city of San Francisco that the Ohlone have cultural practices that deserve increased support and inclusion in the city's future. Their valuable content includes over 1,000 audio cassettes of the Voices of Native Nations pro program hosted by Mary Jean Robertson, um, who we have here this evening, um, on the local radio station KPO since 1972. It also includes poetry readings, tribunals, and HTV cassettes of Ohlone cultural presentations and gatherings in San Francisco. We have been working to identify key parts of their collection to prioritize for digitization and hosting on archive.org as back-end storage to their WordPress site, where photographs of Ohlone cultural presentations and official documents from national and state parks, the city's planning department, Office of Human Rights, and Arts Commission, and private organizations are already featured. Mary Jean and I presented a session on our collaboration at the International Conference of Indigenous Archives, Libraries, and Museums to encourage other tribes to work with the Internet Archive as a platform for storage and information dissemination, and we will continue to speak to the importance of platforms like the Internet Archive to allow communities to maintain control over their own stories and heritage, rather than being subject to the reinterpretation that has historically happened when such collections are acquired by academic institutions and museums. We also have collections that came to us as archives of public access television broadcasts. The availability of video cameras starting in the late 60s meant that, the, that a wider range of people could record and share the stories in their communities to be shared with others. With these new sources of media, the creation of public access television was driven by advocates for the non-commercial use of cable television as an outlet where the general public could generate and broadcast their own content, not that decided by the networks or commercial entities. In the early 1970s, the FCC issued a report that required cable operators to offer three access channels for educational, governmental, and public use in the top television markets across the US. For the first time, cable companies were legally required to open their facilities and their airwaves to anyone who applied on a first-come, first-served basis without control over their programming or content. So some other examples we have. The John Moriarty Archive is the work of the late John Moriarty, a Northern California peace activist and organizer. His weekly cable access show, Talking It Through, discussed local, regional, and state e electoral politics, California prison reform, county education initiatives, local arts and culture, Delta water use and other local environmental issues, and other San Joaquin County topics that the Peace and Justice Network felt were not covered in corporate-owned mass media. Input was a local Philadelphia panel discussion program airing Sunday mornings on the lo local CBS network affiliate that ran from 1968 through early 1971, and it was a groundbreaking series of featuring academics, community and religious leaders, and artists from the Philadelphia area with a focus on social justice and progressive thinking. And this collection exists because of the preservation efforts of Marion Stokes, who is a member of Wellspring's Ecumenical Center and a co-producer of the series. She often appeared on the panel discussion along with her future husband, John S. Stokes, Jr. And then the Community Media Archive is a collection of diverse local programming contributed by community access television productions from across the country, originally a partnership between the Internet Archive and Access Humboldt in late 2008. 
Okay, and then I also want to use the rest of my time here to talk about the open source uh, solutions for affordable housing and banking. The Internet Archive's founder, Brewster Kale, is also leading by example to address the unhealthiness of the society around us, which promotes the reckless pursuit of profit as an indicator of personal value and, and success in life. These attitudes, promoted by the big banks and corporate agendas that have infected our government, are destroying our worlds from our local communities to our planet as a living entity by robbing us of our land, our diverse cultures, and our finite resources. His way of addressing these problems is inspired by the open source software movement, which creates an extra layer of rules that work against the ones imposed by laws such as the Millennium Copyright Act, which restricts the use of creative work whether or not the creators want those rest restrictions in place. So he's fighting back against the hijacking of our housing market with the Foundation House, which is a debt-free housing model that takes mortgage payments out of the equation through ownership of the building without debt. This allows him to offer nonprofit employees rent at cost rather than at market rate and is a benefit to people who are motivated by helping their communities and improving people's lives through education rather than by the ostentatious pursuit and display of wealth. It is his hope that this model is replicated by other individuals and communities and that it can one day be incorporated into governmental programs to help socioeconomic, intellectual, and cultural diversity from being erased from our communities. He's also been working hard to make financial services available with the Internet Credit Union, which keeps funding and profit away from the big banks so that they can be used in a more conscientious and community-oriented way. So thank you for the opportunities uh, for me to share some examples of how the Internet Archive is providing both virtual and physical spaces to help more of our society's voices be heard and stay present in the community. Thank you. Hi, I'm going to uh, just remain sitting and talk to you from here. Um, I just wanted to thank you all for being here. It's, it's always an adventure to leave my little room where I have all my cassette tapes surrounding me. Thousands and thousands of cassette tapes. When you do a radio show every week, two hour radio show for 40 some years, that's a lot of cassette tapes. <laughs> and what that means is it's kind of terrifying as well. We're now doing CDs. I'm not sure that's any better. Um, because it's some of the last interviews that some people have had on the air. There are so many people who've passed on now who we miss Bill Wapipa. Um, I can I can think of, you know, Thomas Binyaka, David Menongi, the um, Mary and Carrie Dan sisters, Billy Frank. I have to say that um, this afternoon, President Obama gave the family of Billy Frank Jr the Congressional Medal of Freedom. He was um, a fisherman. He was our fisherman. He fought for American Indian rights to hunt and fish in their usual and accustomed places. He was the reason that the Bolt decision was so important in Washington State. And he was definitely our hero and deserved the Congressional Medal of Freedom. Um, one of the places that folks went to after they left the island of Alcatraz was to Frank's Landing up in Washington State. They also took over the Cascadia um, area and made it into a Daybreak Star Center and healthcare and programs for the people up in Washington State. Pitt River was another place that they took over after leaving Alcatraz. And another thing that happened today, I happened to notice that in Peru, 
several oil companies just got permission from their government to invade the territory of a non-contacted tribe. And the last time this happened, the contracted, the, the tribe contracted illness and disease and died. And uh, one of the petroleum companies was the Hunt Petroleum Company. And uh, I remember a story that my aunt told me, my godmother. She hid behind the skirts of her mother when this guy, J.P. Hunt, came into this little town in Oklahoma called Fairfax. Because when she was a kid, she heard that he was the one that was killing all the Osage people for their oil rights. So this is not a new thing. This is an ongoing thing. And it's something that created a lot of despair, a lot of distrust, and a lot of horrific stories that people continue to tell in all those little towns in Oklahoma that I grew up with. And I know that the same stories were told in California. And I know that it's for similar reasons for exploitation of the, the uh, mineral rights and the oil rights and the land rights of the indigenous people of those areas. And it's so important to remember that Alcatraz that you saw was a beacon on the air, but it was also a beacon for freedom, for waking up everybody, that all of us have the opportunity to join together to fight against those kinds of exploitation and that kind of genocidal policy, that kind of death. And I find it a very huge privilege to have contributed in any way to the, the dissemination of the information that came out of Alcatraz. Because, again, I think it was actually somebody by the name of Hunt as well, I'm not sure, wanted to build a, uh, a mall, a fancy mall based upon a, a, a fictional time period in San Francisco's history, the 1890s. And um, they were going to have a casino and all kinds of other stuff. And actually the occupation of Alcatraz Island prevented that from happening so that um, the federal government and the city and county and the state of California can have a place where people now come from all over the world to um, see a place that exemplifies, as John Trudell says, the um, the United States of America. It's a prison. And people come to see this prison. And I just want to say that I spoke to Eloy, um, who was one of the um, original occupiers just a couple of days ago. And they are having a um, annual celebration of guards on Alcatraz, where they have a picnic for the guards and their families. They have an annual celebration for the prisoners, where they have the prisoners coming and celebrating and having picnics with their descendants and families. So Eloy says, you know, if it had not been for the occupation of Alcatraz by the Indians of all tribes, coming out of the San Francisco State student strike, demanding the Ethnic Studies Department, demanding a, a, a university, a, a Native American university, and all the demands that came out of Alcatraz, this island would not be in the place where it is. So we're going to have this February 13th, I think it is, February 13th, we're going to be having a annual, the first annual celebration of the occupation of Alcatraz by Indians of all tribes. So, um, 
Thursday, the International Indian Treaty Council is having their um, un-Thanksgiving celebration um, to say prayers and to um, welcome all of you again to Indian land. Last, last year they had over 3,500 people on the island. This year, who knows how many people will show up. The um, tickets are, go on sale at 4 a.m. Thursday morning. And KPFA has been broadcasting the two annual uh, International Indian Treaty Council um, celebrations for um, several years. And I have also been participating in the radio on Radio Free Alcatraz. So um, doing interviews and talking to people. And one of the things that, that I have to share with you, my father told me that one of the things that you have to do whenever you live anywhere is to always remember to honor the people whose land you live on. So that's something that I was able to do with the Ohlone Profiles Project because the Ohlone people are the people, the original people whose land I moved to when I turned 21 and could choose where I lived. I moved to San Francisco in 1969. So I just wanted to say thank you all for, for being here and thank you for listening. Stay tuned to Radio Free Alcatraz. Stay tuned to KPOO and Voices of the Native Nations. And we'll continue to share our stories with you and to hope that you share our return from displacement. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you all for coming tonight and being out here with us. Uh, sharing this important history and talking about displacement. I'm sure that all of you have been impacted by the displacement in San Francisco in one way or another, either watching your neighborhoods change or watching people react to the change. And when I was asked to uh, come here tonight, um, I have one piece in the gallery called City Naloni, uh, which is based on the uh, performance of Bonnie Ora Sherk, uh, Sitting Still. Uh, that was done in 1970, and it brought attention to the interrelationship of um, humanity with uh, nature and our inner connection. And I wanted to build upon that uh, by doing this performance piece and standing with my regalia at various points throughout San Francisco and uh, seeing the reaction, but also having people just uh, what it's like for them to see an Ohlone person here, to bring to mind that we uh, are not only still here, but we have documented history that goes back thousands of years. Uh, at Stanford, there's a site that's been matched to DNA of uh, one of our members, and it goes back 15,000 years. Right here in San Francisco, there are village sites that are being built on despite our protest and disagreement and sadness to lose another site. So uh, when my family was here in 1860 in San Francisco, uh, Aquatic Park used to have a shell mound and that was destroyed. Uh, and in my film, uh, Bridge Walkers, I tried to bring attention to the continuing uh, loss of cultural spaces because these aren't just monuments, these are living places where people prayed over thousands of years as Anne-Marie Sayer says, uh, they uh, had weddings or uh, births and blessings for births and deaths. And so after thousands and thousands and thousands of years, these spaces have important uh, sacred energy and they're still so important and key to our spiritual practice. Uh, currently in Fremont, we just got word yesterday there is a uh, petition on change.org that you can sign. Uh, the city of Fremont is going to be building a parking lot and bathroom on top of another sacred site. I don't know if the bathroom and the, the parking is a, a subtle insult of some sort, but they're always building a parking lot and a bathroom on our sacred sites. 
And uh, the professor, you know, was discussing the history. Uh, it is, of course, well known in other places, the genocide that occurred, but unfortunately here in California, we suffered two waves of incredible uh, genocide and loss. First with the mission system. Um, I spend a lot of time in the mission records. I spend a lot of time reading our relatives' histories and what they shared for us today so that we could know what they were thinking, what was going on. Uh, and we go through the mission records and frankly, if you're trying to convert people, I find it uh, to be a failure to have lost so many people to death. And unfortunately, we look through the records and we see people literally coming in to the mission and dying within two weeks, within a year. And this uh, loss of life uh, and the diseases that, that came were not just uh, uh, smallpox, they were also diseases that came through rape. So syphilis unfortunately impacted a lot of women and made them sterile and so they were not able to have children and in the missions they were given wooden dolls as punishment and asked to carry them around in public. And you'll see here there is a, a doll here uh, uh, with the canonization of Sarah. You know we constantly have to deal with Alcatraz and uh, canonization of Sarah, it's just like a constant, constant rewounding, constant trauma, cult cultural trauma of not uh, mattering, not existing, not being visible. And um, so I have started creating these dolls and exhibiting them uh, as a way to transform that experience for my ancestors, to try to transform. Uh, we are tasked with that. We're tasked with trying to transform a history that is so um, painful. And when I started doing my research, I realized that, uh, you know, we were just the last people colonized. Europeans were colonized thousands of years ago. At one time, Europeans had the same way of living and many of the same beliefs. And at that break in history, something happened. And I bring that up because we're talking about displacement. And you're the next generation. And you're here in a, an amazing city uh, where you can uh, really form policies and practices for the next generations. And so I ask you to go back and think, think to the back. Think back and, and ask, what does it mean to have that sort of philosophy of living? To displace elders, to displace disabled people, what exactly are we doing to create a second gold rush here in San Francisco? And so uh, I, I try to transform the experience because it's uh, so difficult sometimes to live with the history. And I want you to know that we're not just that history. We are beautiful, strong people who have survived so much. And art has been one of our main uh, tools for overcoming. Uh, my family, my family, I have a, a long history of, of family members who are musicians and are to this day. Um, and I try through my own art to uh, process the experiences that I go through or as a community and to participate and involve the community. So we're doing workshops uh, in making these mission dolls as a way of processing cultural trauma, a way of talking about it. And that's really where the idea for an Ohlone Native American Museum and Cultural Center came from. The idea is a world-class Smithsonian Museum of the American Indian West in San Francisco. Uh, Native art is appreciated around the world and as a tourist destination, I believe that this museum and cultural center can be a wonderful bridge and home for us to exchange ideas and information about history. It's also a fantastic idea to train native archivists, museum uh, administrators, and artists. Uh, Mary Jean and I were on the Native American Pro Programming Committee at the De Young Museum. And we had a great opportunity to collaborate with them and bring some exhibits forward. But one thing we realized is that the De Young has its own track, uh, its own objectives, which I, I don't criticize in any way, but we have really important needs 
First is Ohlone people. There are collections of our archives and art all around the Bay Area that we don't have access to. So I enjoyed the conversation about bringing out through an archive, you know, having access to our own materials. Uh, so that's one of the reasons is, uh, unfortunately, we hear from everybody that nobody really knows what the Ohlone did, or uh, there, there's a few page written. Well, it turns out everybody writing was, was living here. And so um, there was uh, the cultural dissidence, I think, is, is what happens uh, then and happens now with the issue of displacement. Um, so the Museum and Cultural Center, I think, can be a, a wonderful benefit. Um, and San Francisco Art Institute, of course, has a history of reaching out to a, a broad and diverse community. We just saw the uh, installation today, which was so, so well done. Um, the Mujeres Muralistas, many of them received scholarships and came and studied here in the 70s. Um, and so I am really grateful to the Art Institute for reaching out to us and involving us and bringing us here and for you to open your hearts and to listen. Uh, because I think, you know, obviously the policy was to try to separate us. We're always supposed to be different, but we're really not that different in the end. And so we have to fight against that policy that wanted to separate us. Because if you became close to us, how would you feel when you see what happened to us? Or when we talk today about things. Like, I was shocked to hear that the FBI went after uh, Len Leonard Pertier. Uh, this young man that, that was shot uh, in a, in a uh, what was that guy's name? Uh, uh, shot the kid with the, the, the uh, candy and the soda. Uh, that guy uh, made his artwork, <laughs> sold it at it. So, I, I mean, I just, obviously we constantly have to deal with these two approaches to everything. Even today, like my cousin Greg Castro says, it's not just in the past. It's today that it's happening. Our sites are being destroyed today. We don't have access to uh, services. Uh, we're, so it's, um, I think for, for me personally, art has been a way to uh, share the history and transform a very difficult experience into something positive. And I hope that the museum and cultural center will one day stand on Market uh, Street uh, among uh, and next to the United Nations. San Francisco is home to the United Nations. Um, one of the reasons I put it into uh, the exhibit piece was to uh, bring up the issue of the Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People. And there are a lot of frameworks for legal rights and protecting that just are not implemented. And that's not a sh surprise, because there was hardly, uh, I, guess, I don't think any treaty that was, was actually implemented. So um, I'm going to close with that. I just want to thank you again for listening and not being frightened off uh, and looking deeper and connecting and wanting to connect with us. Thank you so much. Hey everyone, how are you tonight? I feel a kind of, you know, I, I am from Mexico City originally. My great grandmother was Nahuatl, you know, and she lost all her family in the, during the Mexican Revolution. She was very strong character, very small, very skinny, but super strong. She had a big business, she, she managed a lot of people. But the, so in, in my father's side, and in my mother's side, I was talking today with my aunt this morning in Los Angeles, and we were talking about food. You know, and, and, and I was thinking, we were, we were talking about all the different places that my grandmother in my mother's side and my mother could cook every day, you know. Every day they cook for three months different different meals. In in Mexico, actually, the Mexican food is the the only gastronomy in the world that is an intangible, is the world heritage by United, United Nations UNESCO. And and I was very impressed, and I was thinking that I never heard the music of the Nahuatl or the Toltecs or the Zapotecs. I never smelled their 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 clothes or their flowers. But 
every day I can taste their food, you know. That is the only thing that I can be proud of to, to keep this, this heritage. And, and I really have to defend it. So I think that we all, as Ojlón, as uh, mestizos from Mexico, as an immigrants, we have to, to start with the, the, these things that we are immediate to us. In, in this way, I think food is the most immediate thing that we all have, everyone, have, every day we have, we have uh, este, contact with. And I think we have to, to restore this relationship between food and with our seed, with our soil, the way we, we have been cooking for millennia. So, and, and also, I, I was thinking in displacement, because I've been working in, in San Francisco, we've been talking before about policies in San Francisco. In 2007, I don't know how many of you remember about the, the raids against, against immigrants in, in the United States, in different places. There were raids and immigration was arresting immigrants. And, and in 2006, before, the, there was the HR 4437, that was a legislation that was presented in the House of Representatives to criminalize immigration in the United States. And we organized the largest mobilizations in the history of the United States in 2006. I don't know if you remember, there were mobilizations of 400,000 people, 700,000 people in Los Angeles, Chicago, New York, everywhere were amazing. And we stopped the HR 4427 that was going to criminalize immigrants. And if we think on immigrants, we think on farmers, we think on people who are growing food that are coming from Mexico, from small towns. And they are indigenous people, they are, they are Native Americans. And they live in the mission and they came all the way because they were displaced from there. And now, they, in, in, in this moment in Mexico, many more people are displaced from their small towns because there are resources. And all this war ag against drugs in Mexico is no different than the war in, Col the war in Colombia, where they create all this, this work against drug trafficking. In Latin America, they send a lot of weapons, and they kill a lot of people, and they, then they, they create this, this cop, this, is the, how you say, low, low bodies, that control huge areas, and then they were able, the, the corporations in the U.S., they were able to come and invest, and they were covered by, by this, this military or police bodies from any kind of revolt, you know. They, 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 what, what happened is they opened the, the path so they could come to extract all the, to destroy and extract the resources that they want. And it's no different than what's happening now in Mexico with the 43 students who were kidnapped in Mexico. It's, it's a very rich area, there, are, there is a lot of gold, different resources, and they are creating chaos, they are creating fear, just to go and extract all, all the resources. But further, more I have to, I, I, I think that we also ha have to think what, why, why we are competing too much about resources, destroying, extracting, producing, consuming and wasting, you know, and, and it's not just the, the brainwash from corporations in TV ads or in radio, but I think also has a lot to do with anthropocentrism, with human centrism, and, and we are not respecting the, the world because we think that we are smarter than other animals, we are another animal, <laughs> and, and we have to, to think where, where, what kind of boundaries we are overpassing, because we are not living just in San Francisco. We can say, I, I am from the mission and I live in the mission. But actually, the water bottle that I used three weeks ago, maybe now is in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And this is another oil spill that no one talks about, you know. This, this is not just the oil spill from, from ships that are carrying oil, but also the transformed oil that is floating now in, in, in the ocean. I was reading about this guy who got lost, stranded in a boat, and after nine months, he was in the middle of the Pacific, and he says, and, and I learned how to, to identify different kind of plastic floating on the ocean, to use them to capture water. So, so it's, it's, it's very interesting. We are living in, in, in these communities, in this society, in, in these cities, like 
And I live in Portland now because I cannot afford to live in the mission. I am an activist. I am too poor. I am not a techie. And, and in Portland, everyone is talking uh, about gentrification. And, and these people, when they talk about gentrification, these young people, I say, you know, I think that the, the problem is not the real estate, it's, it's us, that we are demanding a space in a city that we cannot afford, but we can create our small communities, we can go 50 friends and, and move into a very small town, we're going to pay $100 for rent each, and we can restart from, from zero. And, and that is going to happen, is what, what is going to happen at the end of the day, that if the, everyone is expecting a collapse, who here is not expect, expecting an economic or, and social collapse? Can you raise your hand if you are not expecting a collapse? So after the collapse, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? We, will ha we need demographic dispersion. We will need to move to small towns because it's unsustainable to live in Los Angeles, in New York. These are going to be hells. So eventually we will have to move to small towns, to live in small communities, and we won't be able to commute anywhere else, like traveling. I am going to India next month, and later when I come back, we go to Australia. No, we will have to live forever in small towns. So because there won't be oil, and if there is oil, we won't be able to use it anymore, you know? And we'll find ways to sequester back carbon into the soil. This is the only solution to mitigate climate change. And we will have to prepare from now, you know? The next, the next few years, what we're gonna do, where we really wanna live, and in we, how we wanna co coexist with nature, with the different ecosystems that we have been killing for the past three, four hundred years, no? or more. So, I'm gonna pass the microphone, and I wanna thank you for, for being here, and I, will, uh, and, and I will thank you if, if every time you see an immigrant on the street, you think that they are not the Native Americans, they are the indigenous people, the people who, who was displaced from small towns, from different reasons, from corporations, from white suprem supremacists. And when, when it's not just white, white supremacists, there are Mexican supremacists, there are Chinese supremacists, Russian supremacists. And, and, este, and I, I really think that we all are immigrants, we migrate from somewhere else, and we lost track of our past, our roots, and we have to recover them by practicing every day a uh, different lifestyle, starting from our foods and our food. Thank you. I want to thank everybody for being here. I want to thank all of the um, folks that I'm on the panel with. I'm very honored to be here with you guys. I listen to you all the time on the radio. It's really exciting to hear your voice in person. Um, and I'm very grateful for starting it off with the Alcatraz um, movie. Um, I think that everybody should watch the movie Alcatraz is Not an Island um, because it's an awesome whole documentary about um, the occupation and how that occupation has really impacted barrier politics um, and myself as well. I feel like a lot of my politics have come because of that occupation. Um, I was born and raised here. Um, my family um, was impacted by the the occupation. A lot of families came here or individuals came here because they wanted to be a part of the occupation and so it definitely has influenced the politicization of the native community here in the Bay Area um, and has definitely raised me with ceremony and raised me with um, with sunrise gatherings uh, because of that space and also raised me with direct action as an idea that's something that is um, familiar and necessary for our survival. Not that it's something foreign that came to us from Greenpeace or that you know was brought to us by um, in environmentalist, but that is definitely a tactic that we have been using for a very long time, um, and that has been successful. Uh, the reason why I feel like the occupation was successful was because after them being on the island for 18 months, they negotiated to get off the island, but to exchange them leaving the island for some of their demands. And some of their demands were to have cultural centers and community centers where we could grow up in. And so I, this happened before I was born, but I was able to grow up with these cultural centers um, as community spaces, which have gardens in front, murals inside, um, dancing on weekdays, dinners, gatherings, drumming, um, and all of those cultural activities that, that have a space, have a space because of the people who slept on that cold island for 18 months. 
Um, they negotiated to get a school. So there's an actual college that's a two-year two college that you can go to and then transfer to a university from that's called DQ University, which is also on um, formerly federal land um, that was negotiated for in exchange for them getting off the island. So that they used the same treaty from 1968 that said that any federal and public land that was no longer being used by the government would be returned to the people. They used that same as an exchange to get this old radio station um, turned into a college. So there's now a tribal school. And so I got to go on field trips to go see that when I was in high school and be like, oh, wow, look at the murals. Look at this amazing story that's told on the walls. And all of those things I really feel like led to my um, understanding of storytelling and placemaking. Um, and so I'm very grateful for all of you guys being with us. I know it's been a really long day. Um, but can I ask everybody for a quick favor? Are you guys willing to do a stand-up and activity really quick with me? Is that, is that cool? Could everybody stand up? I know it's been a very long day and people have been listening to and absorbing a whole lot of stories and a lot of information. But I would like to ask everybody if they could just reach up in the sky and just pull down some energy into their bodies, maybe pull up from some of the people that have been here before and are no longer with us, and pull that energy into your body, and then can we bend forward and reach downwards to the ground to where we come from, maybe connect with the ground, and pull up some energy from the ground, pull up some energy from our roots, from our ancestors, from those that are below us, um, and pull some of that energy into our bodies. And then when you stand up, bring that up into you, and can we reach to the right, and pull, for, pull to all of our friends that are on the right and stretch out and pull everybody that we know that's on the right and can we st stretch to meet them where they are and then can we pull them towards the left and pull everybody that we know <laughs> and then stretch out to the left. And I think that that's, that's a lot of the work is pulling everybody that we know that's on the right and then pulling them to the left. Um, so thank you for engaging in that exercise. I hope there's more energy in our bodies right now. Um, and so I, I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the art that I've been able to be a part of. And so as I was saying, I grew up here and saw murals as like a normal thing on the streets of the Mission District. Um, I've, I thought that that was just how everywhere was. And then I left and I was like, whoa, where's all the pain at? Like I, I went other places and, and I realized that uh, we live in a very special place. And I didn't really understand that until I was able to travel around a little bit after I graduated high school. And then I realized that the Mujeres Muralistas who went to school here and then went into the Mission district and painted the beginning of the murals in the 70s really did establish a legacy which those of us who grew up around seeing it thought that that was just how everywhere is but it's not like that everywhere not every wall is used as a way to tell a story but um, but I, I I believe that it is a way for us to tell a story and a lot of their ideology came from the Mexican muralist movement um, which basically stated that not everybody is literate and not everybody is literate in the same language because in Mexico, there's hundreds of indigenous languages that are spoken in front of Spanish. And so all of us here in the US think of Mexico, everybody speaks Spanish, but that's not true. A lot of people, Spanish is their second language and Nahuatl or Purepecha or other languages are the first language. And so it's a, a very diverse place full of all of these different folks. And so to establish a common story is rough. Right, And then if they put it on paper and put it in a library, it's not, not only is it rough, but it's inaccessible. And so muralism is this idea that the history of the people can be told on the walls and in public spaces. And I think that what Alcatraz brought to us was the idea that there is public space that belongs to all of us, that does not only belong to one corporation who wants to put a museum, or the other proposal was to put a mall, or the other proposal was to put um, a theme park right, like a great America. Um, but all of those uh, proposals were to take Alcatraz and make it a private place so that it would not be a public space. It would not be something that belongs to the people. It would be something that belongs to a corporation that would be making money off of it. Um, and so I think that is what we see as the root of most of the displacement that we've heard about tonight is that there's this idea that something that is a, a public good or a public property is um, valued as a commodity and can be transferred into um, a corporation or a company to profit from. And, and then because the land that we stand on is golden, then our lives are not worth anything and we're um, disposable. And so I think that this, this idea of public versus private is very important for our generation. Uh, I, my generation grew up with candlestick as something that belonged to all of us. 
It's something that our tax dollars, my entire life, my parents' entire life, our tax dollars have paid for Candlestick to be established as a place that's a park. It belongs to not any one corporation, but it belongs to the, the Department of Parks, Park and Rec of San Francisco. And at this point in our history right now, that has been demolished in front of our faces, and there is now a Lennar Corporation that is building up private housing there. And Lennar is going to make a killing, not, not even like just like figuratively, like a killing by selling these houses in this toxic area um, where the shipyards are established and um, selling these, these houses to people. Um, and I totally got to keep talking about the murals, though, so... <laughs> <laughs> so what this, this transformation of um, things that belong to the people turning into things that belong to corporations, I think, is a, a definite theme of why displacement has been happening. And so I want to point to this picture, which is a mural that was painted on a reservation in Northern California in Humboldt. Um, it's on the... Um, it's on the Yurok tri uh, tribe's land, and the pattern that surrounds it is the Yurok, and also the Hoopa um, people call this the frog foot pattern, which is a pattern that is specifically for healing. Um, and then within it is stories that the people brought to our muralist crew um, with photos of their interpretations of the campaign that they waged to bring down the dams along the Klamath River. And so they brought their photos in, and we were able to come up with a collective image of what the campaign looked like um, that they waged to bring down the dams in defense of the salmon. And it starts off with, there's a salmon kill over here, um, and that actually happened in 99, and then there's a sign that says avoid contact with the water, and there's this green water. They actually had gone out and harvested the green sludgy water, so they knew exactly what color to mix when we were trying to make the color, and I was like, like this, and they were like, no, no, that's too dark. You got to make it like a bright neon green, um, because they had had firsthand contact with it, and they were talking about how it smelled when the fish died, and um, so they, they led a protest where they... Um, lit a fire in a ceremonial way, and they roasted um, salmon, and then they stood in front of a shareholders meeting for the corporation that owned the dam, and they actually gave out salmon to all the shareholders as they were walking into the meeting. So when they went into meetings to make a decision on whether or not that dam should exist, they had the taste of salmon from the Klamath River on their palate in their mouth that was given to them by a person in traditional regalia and s smiling at them and saying, here, take this, you know, not, not an aggressive protester with a picket sign, but a traditional person saying, this fish is important to our survival and for our children's survival, so your dam needs to come down. Um, so I think that was an example of uh, one of the ways that I saw muralism as a technique um, to tell people stories. And then after being a part of that project, I was able to go to Palestine and this is an example of a mural that we painted in Gaza. Um, so a crew of us went to go paint a series of 10 murals all about water um, in the Gaza Strip. And so this young woman is using aerosol spray paint to write water is a human right in Arabic behind her on a wall at an elementary school where the UNESCO, well, well this UN-funded group has put water filtration systems at some of these schools. And so we used spray paint and brush paint as a way to kind of um, create this, I don't know, we wanted to create a force field around it, but I guess we just created a beautiful picture around it to really like uh, assert that this water filtration system is important and that it needs to be protected. Um, and that also that there's a very huge injustice going on in that place that creates the need that they need to filter their water because um, the reason why their water is contaminated is because of a huge injustice, which has to do with the displacement of the Palestinian people by um, the Israeli people. And so the government of the Israeli um, forces has taken so much of the water um, out from under the aquifers in the Palestinian territory that the water aquifers have gone under sea level, and then salt water has rushed in. Um, and so 95% of the water that's underground and available in the Gaza Strip is contaminated. And so this mural project was a way for us as internationals to go over and lend our art and also bring back the stories of the people of what they're going through under occupation. Um, and this is an example of a flotilla, an image of a flotilla that we painted. Um, and the flotilla says, to Gaza with love, in English in the front, and the banner says the same thing in Arabic behind. And uh, we painted this at a... a a kindergarten in the Gaza Strip near Rafa, near the southern border, near Egypt, um, at the same time that um, a flotilla was being organized in the Mediterranean Sea. They were on their way 
on boats to all arrive in Gaza and they were stopped by the Israeli military so it was not able to bring any of the medical supplies or uh, people who were coming in solidarity on the boats. But it definitely got a huge amount of attention to the occupation and how the occupation is not only fortified with um, cement walls and barbed wire and guns but also on water. Um, and so this mural was a collaboration with local artists from, Ga from Gaza and from um, the Bay Area. And um, when I came back, we were able to work on this mural in Oakland. And um, Nadal, who spoke earlier, was one of the artists that helped to paint this one. And this is a series of trees that we painted um, on 21st Street, and across the street from the Uptown Auto Body Shop in Oakland. 26th Street, sorry, right? So 26th Street um, near Telegraph. And each of the trees was uh, painted by a different artist. Each artist comes from a different um, background. So there's a Native American, a Chicano, an Asian, two Asian Americans, uh, an African American, a Palestinian American, a Jewish American um, artists that all contributed their artwork to paint these trees and to incorporate into the trees images that they feel like were um, representative of their ideas of um, solidarity with Palestine. And so a lot of people drew within the roots and within the trunk and within the, tr the branches of the tree different images that relate where, where each of the artists comes from and the idea of solidarity that they wanted to portray on the wall. Um, and so there's a cr in this picture, there's a bunch of volunteers across the bottom that are helping to contribute to the border of the image. Um, and so what I, what I feel like this image does is it's a, a story um, it tells the stories of all these different people who are all saying that uh, we stand on the side of justice and that in order to be on the side of justice, the trees in Palestine and the people in Palestine need to be able to grow. Um, and so this is uh, still there and you guys can check it out. And there's also another one close by that's a water rights mural on um, Broadway and 20th. Uh, and both of those are examples of collaborative murals where a lot of people from the neighborhood got to help on the paint days and contribute ideas and contribute um, effort. And so what I, what I feel like that process does more than just create a beautiful picture, um, it collectively builds a story and allows people to contribute to the creation of the story by painting it. And so maybe Maybe somebody just showed up one day and used a paintbrush for an hour, but that effort I feel like is similar to um, what, what we were talking about earlier when she was saying that there was all these different spaces within the Bay Area that have been prayed at, that have been um, sacred. You know, there's shell mounds that are here and maybe they're destroyed, but still in those places people gathered and people put collective energy and collective um, prayer together and that act is what made that space sacred. And so I think before this it was a wall that had graffiti on it and after that people have used it in their music videos. People have um, taken pictures in front of it every single day. There's cars lined up taking pictures in front of it and people have brought their parents, their grandmas when they come visit, their you know um, friends who are visiting to come see it because it's something that people are proud of. Um, so definitely I feel like that's what the, the act of muralism has really brought to my life and I'm happy to share it with people because it definitely transforms space um, and allows people to assert that there is space that is public that belongs to all of us um, and that we need to continue to take care of public space and um, assert the fact that not everything is for sale and that many things need to be established as for the people and not just for profit. So thank you guys so much for um, bearing with me. Well, thank you. And, uh, you know, I hear this talk about the murals and uh, Mujeres Muralistas. I'm old enough, back in 1970, I worked for the Art Commission, Neighborhood Arts Program, and uh, we commissioned a lot of these murals. The first mural was Spain Rodriguez, 22nd and Folsom. It was um, Horizons Unlimited. Then the second one was uh, Mission Rebels on Venice, and there was Robert Crumb and Chuy Campuzano. Those were, those were the, the first mural that came out. And after that, Mike Rio started painting almost like, oh, two a week. Um, to establish a certain identity in the mission, in 1970, 69, 70, the BART was coming in, um, redevelopment was coming in, and they wanted to tear down from 24th and Mission all the way down to Harrison. 
and there was a mission coalition it got together and resisted. And uh, I'm very proud of this coalition because they offer a lot of money to these people in the coalition and resisted. They said no. There was other communities, other neighborhoods that said yes to the money um, and they paid a high price for it. Uh, Fillmore, Hayes Valley, all those places. And to this day, uh, uh, it's come around full circle. Um, the, the evictions in the mission, the fires, the fires started actually in the 70s. The Garland Hotel, 16th in Mission. Uh, several people died, and we really um, started protesting back then. Victor Miller, North Mission News, he reported on these fires. Um, I also was involved with Lou DeMonte's Richard Montoya uh, with a film called The Other Barrio. Um, and it was filmed in the mission. It's about fires in the mission. It's about evictions in the mission, because we're confronting that all the time. And uh, I myself was uh, <coughs> served with eviction, and I fought it for two years. Raquel Fox from the, uh, uh, the Tenderloin Housing Clinic, she helped me out. She helped also the uh, Pigeon Palace artist uh, community and other households, about eight households, to be bought by Meta Mission Economic Development and City Land Trust so we could stay. Um, I've been to the Art Commission fighting for uh, ways that artists can stay in, in San Francisco because we need communal studios. <laughs> the, I used to have a studio and I used to pay 250 a month. Now that place goes for 10,000 a month. So that's quite a difference. Um, and uh, I can't do large things anymore. But we need communal studios, we need jobs for artists. I spoke to the Art Commission. Back in the 70s, we had jobs for artists and, um, and we did a lot of outreach. And that's what we need now. We need uh, artists graduating from the Art Institute to get well-paying jobs, doing public artwork, teaching communities, helping those communities resist. There's, I know there's uh, Art Hazelwood here with a group of silkscreen artists that go to the mission they print for free and pass out posters. So we need those kind of actions. So, um, and um, other things that I've spoken to the um, Art Commission about is all these other uh, things that are disappearing. I made a list for them. Um, that's no longer Esta Noche nightclub. 16th, now it's a slick place. La Raza Silkscreen, Encantada Gallery, La Posta, Mexicano Bar, Galanz, um, all these places. Um, submission, Submission on 18th and Mission. There was a, a Mexican and white, and white punk bar. I mean, um, no, Balazzo, it started on 24th and Mission. It went to 18th and Mission, and they got evicted. They got bought out. To me, that was a cultural center, and I went to the Art Commission, but they said, there's nothing we can do, they're punks. You know? <laughs> but uh, that's part of our culture. So uh, there's all these issues you know, that we have to deal with. I, I dealt with them historically before, we did posters and we did uh, books in the Galleria. We had a Mimeo machine. Uh, today, we're, it's a different scene. We're using Alicat Bookstore, Brava Theater, Galleria La Raza, Mission Cultural Center to give a face and to give a voice to what's happening in our communities. So we have meetings in the centers and try to uh, bring up the issues try to, like in the old days, mobilize people because we're facing tremendous odds. And I tell you, you know, I've been to meetings with a San Francisco Democratic Club 
And those guys are worse than Trump, <laughs> let me tell you. You know, they, they're really, um, you know, people think, oh, Democrats, real liberals. But you confront these people on, the, um, on these boards, and uh, all they can talk about is jobs, 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 union jobs, you know, you don't know. But that doesn't really do anything for us. They're not employing our people. So there's, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that uh, I can um, complain about, but, uh, you know, I try to have a positive spin and talking to our young people in the mission and say, you know, like back in the 70s and 90s, we fought this eviction, we've got to fight it again. And it's, and it's hard because democracy is not working for us. I, you know, uh, supported compost. I really uh, spent a lot of time and money trying to get him elected because he had the best voice. But we were against tremendous odds. We were outspent like, for every dollar, we were outspent $50,000. You know, just unsurmountable odds. They hired people. Uh, they, the opposition, they had Barbara Boxer, Feinstein, Gavin Newsom, they had all these big shots, Mayor Lee, and um, so it's, it's not working out for us. Proposition I, we work really hard, but we, again, we, we being outspent this money uh, seems to be overriding democracy. So there's a lot of uh, issues. Um, of what's going on. Um, also, um, you know, uh, the Galeria, that's a new generation that's there now, but they're, they have their own spin, they have their own issues. Now, uh, they're fighting, you know, in my, in my day, when we were there, we were fighting uh, with the exhibit anti-apartheid, we were um, uh, sort of uh, showcasing what was happening in Chile, in South Africa, in El Salvador, in Nicaragua. Uh, Michelle Vignes with the American Native, we exhibited AIM. Um, so we had all these ways to put across. And now what they're facing is uh, a homophobic uh, backlash. So they had a billboard burnt. They had their windows broken. So every every generation has to uh, fight its own battles. So and talk about fighting battles. You know, I'm gonna go um, uh, out with um, little sayings about Trump. <laughs> because I'm I'm very upset about Trump because he gets so much media and uh, what he's saying against Mexicans, what he's, you know, we're race, rapists. And what's really happening is over a million Mexicans are going back to Mexico. The immigration is down at zero. You know, people are, you know, not really coming across, but he's making it sound like it, it's a wave of Mexicans coming here to rape and take jobs. And, all of that, and it's really, it's a new wave of racism. We used to have Ronald Reagan, we used to have Pete Wilson, and now this guy, Trump, believe, believe me, you know, it's, uh, uh, and people are, are being uh, sort of beaten up because of Trump. Um, from uh, people that are Muslim descent, Mexican descent, are, are being uh, beat up. So I really, it's something that we really have to resist along, along with displacement, this, this cultural displacement he wants to. He wants to come down in the middle of the night, take families away. And it's, yeah, I mean, if you think about it, it would cost so much money. But uh, anyway, that's my tirade about Trump. <laughs> and I want to leave you with a little poem uh, about smashing a Trump piñata. They sell them on Valencia Street, <laughs> Casa Bonham Park. So I wrote this. I smashed a Trump piñata and dead Smurfs came out. 
I smash a trampanata and puro pedo came out. I smash a trampanata and Mexican rapists came out singing La Bamba. I smash a trampanata and oh, I better not say this one. <laughs> I smash a Trump piñata and burning moss came out. I smash a Trump piñata and fascism came out. Thank you very much.